awesome, awesome. I hope everybody's having a good day. Not very hungover anymore. <laughs> but Jake is about to give us a great talk on mainframes and uh, take it away. So this talk is gonna be about uh, how I found mainframe buffer flows and how you can as well. Um, so uh, about me, I, uh, I live in the UK in Basingstoke and uh, so my Twitter handle is that if you want to follow me for basically mainframe shit posting. The slides aren't on? Oh. Oh, I wasn't meant to plug someone in. Sorry about that. Oh, you're okay, Lab. Oh, yeah. You got this. Got it. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So after university, I got my first real job as a security consultant, and uh, at that point I had no, no clue what a mainframe really was, but my boss's boss asked if I wanted to do a mainframe job, and I, was, I wasn't going to say no, so I, uh, luckily we had a, um, a mainframe emulator, the company had it, and so during the pandemic I was just mucking around with that, trying to find out how you would do uh, ZOS exploits. The, um, the emulator is a $10,000 USB you stick into your computer to say, yes, you can run it. It's, uh, so around about last May, I found my first uh, zero day on ZOS, and it kind of typifies how sometimes the ZOS vulnerability development type thing works, and so the job had a, there, was a, there was a program running on Windows, Linux, and ZOS. And for Windows and Linux, you had the, the normal requirements. But for ZOS, I got told that I could send an email to someone, they could run it on their computer, and they'd tell me what, what came up. Obviously, that is just no way to actually test a program. So um, I found out that that program that we were going to test was on that mainframe emulator we had. So I just uh, took a month-long holiday and worked out that one of the binaries was vulnerable to a APF authorized DSA overflow, which I'll explain what that is later in the talk. And so, but the TLDR is that if you are able to get it that, that exploit, you're able to take full control of the system. Um, so since then, I found a fair number of zero days, found one uh, last night. Um, the uh, if you look up on the CVE site, you can see that uh, there's basically no vulnerabilities for ZOS. Don't let someone fool you by saying that that means it's unhackable because there's nothing there. It's because IBM Z doesn't report these, at least not publicly to everyone. They just they tell people on an internal security portal. So, yeah. Um, so when people talk about mainframes, uh, they can mean multiple of things. They can talk about AS400, HP nonstop, ZOS, and um, Z on Linux, or Linux on Z. And these basically share nothing between each other other than the fact that they're big computers. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be saying ZOS instead of mainframes, because um, that's what I'm actually good at exploiting. So um, one thing that when you're first starting, uh, learning about ZOS and you know about Linux, people will tell you things like uh, these, this, this feature on uh, feature X on Linux is like feature Y on ZOS. And so one good example of that is files are like data sets. However, um, this is fine for people who are just regular users of the system or who are pen testing just uh, the con like doing a host review of ZOS. But if you want to do um, like vulnerability research, uh, you need to know like the nitty gritty of how these things are actually working. And so one of the big differences between data sets and files is that a file is just a load of bytes and it's the, uh, it's the application that chooses how to process that. But on ZOS, every data set has a, uh, you define what a data set's format is like beforehand. So I might say that uh, this data set is a fixed block and a L record, a record length of 80. Um, 
this is uh, this can be where you can have buffer overflows on um, ZOS where you pass it a larger L record than it's expecting. Um, another big difference is that ZOS has a flat file system, so there's no uh, folders. You might have um, in, you might have datasets logically separated, so you'll have, for example, Jake.homework.math, and you can say, give me all um, data sets that start with the high level qualifier Jake dot blah -blah, blah and it'll give you all of those but there's no actual folders. Um, then you also have uh, a difference between sequential and partition data sets and the uh, sequential data sets are kind of just like normal files. Partitioned look like a folder and you can enter them and see that they have lots of different members which look like files but it's it's un under like underneath the surface it's completely different um, yeah. so here is an example of a uh, partition data set ibm user dot cntl and the uh, the member is alloc std and this is the contents of that data set or that that member and this is a uh, this is a JCL, which is a which is job control language, and I've heard it described as uh, old timey YAML. And the way it uh, the way this used to work is you would have this on a punch card, you would feed it into the system, and then you would check your line printer for your your output. This doesn't happen anymore; everything is emulated. The uh, the first line of every single JCL is the um, is the job card, and when I say first line, it's not uh, lines one to six count on the same line because there's a comma at the end of those lines, which means it's a continuation line. It's, uh, it's just how it is. Um, and you have different things on here, like uh, the job name, alloc std. You have message class and message level. This is what's telling the printer, hey, I want you to print this much information about what happened on the job. And you also have something called user and password. This is kind of like uh, uh, Sue on Linux, where you can submit a job as another user, either by providing both the username and password, or just the user and having access to do that. Um, the next line, the step 01, is a, uh, is, a, is, a, is a step which runs the program IEFBR14. That, uh, that then also has on the next line a DD statement and what the DD statement means is that IEFBR14 can reference a DD fixed 32760, it could write to it, it could read from it and it would uh, then write to that data set. So what happens is every time you start a new job it has its own uh, address space and this is also a good example of where comparing Linux and ZOS kind of falls apart. So on, uh, people often compare the Nucleus and the CSA of ZOS to, or ZArch to the Linux kernel. But as you can see on here, every job on the system, no matter what program you're running, has the ability to address the Nucleus, which is something which you can't do on uh, Linux and like just addressing it normally. And also if for example you were able to write to the Nucleus or the CSA, you would be able to fully like break the system. So the, these are protected but it's, yeah. Um, I'll get to that later. Then the next uh, important parts of memory is that you have some private memory and this can be divided into private high and private low. Private high memory is memory that is shared between all steps in a job. So for example, you might, uh, in that JCL we had, that job name would be some addressable part of memory and that would be the same in every single step. So um, yeah, and then there's private low which you could consider basically like normal, like if a program needs memory to run its actual program, that's where it will be running it to. If you're wondering how ASLR works on ZOS, it only moves around the private low memory. So this is how I bypass ASLR, is I just uh, find some gadgets in private high or the nucleus. 
because that won't move. Um, so another important thing about Zarch is that instead of having things like the um, instruction uh, the current that the instruction register or uh, condition code registers, this is all in memory so and it's so this is and this is called a PSW or a program status word as you can see it's got the instruction address and the condition code but the other thing which is important about Zarch is you also have two more things you have supervisor state and the key. What supervisor state is, is it allows you to run all the fun instructions on Zarch that let you, uh, so for example, change key, or there's an instruction called uh, MV MVCS, which literally just lets you write to another address space. So if, if you're in that, it's, it's quite good. Uh, and then the key is every single page of memory is protected by a, uh, by a storage key and you need to have the correct key to access it. So if I wanted to write to some uh, key four memory, I would need to be in key four. And uh, also, if I want to read from that memory, if it's fetch protected, which is a way you can set it to be, you also need to be in key four. So uh, there's also one additional thing, whereas if you're in key zero, you're allowed to access anything you want. So what would we do if we could write to anything we want? Um, we would want to escalate our privileges, and the way we do this is uh, by editing the ZOS Aki. And you can think of this like a UID or a GUID, but uh, it's, in, it's, it's in our own address space in a private high, uh, in, a pri in private high storage. So it's the same across every single job so if we could write to this uh, ACEE, we're able to change our privileges in one step, then in the next step, um, say, so for example, one of the privileges we'd give ourselves is RACF special, and what this does is it says, anytime I want to, uh, anytime, anytime I uh, want to give myself access to something, say I'm allowed to give myself access to it, so we just flip that in one step. We, we, we flip our Aki bit in one bit, give ourselves special, and then the next step, we just say, also give us access to everything. And then, yeah. And yeah, but this is stored in key zero memory, so not only certain types of programs are allowed to edit this. So how do we edit it? Um, we can just use a simple Zotch assembly program, which uh, uses mode set, which uh, allows us to go into key zero or supervisor state, and you're only allowed to use this if you are, if you yourself are in supervisor state, or if you have a certain, or if you're running APF authorized. So after we get into uh, key zero, we load our um, through what's called control blocks, and we find out where our ACEE is in memory. We then just flip a bit that says we're special and we're good. For, this is part of the reason why um, IBM was only able to put ASLR on the private low memory because if they put it on everything, they would end up breaking all the control blocks which would break all the other programs that are actually running. So how do we, how do we get in supervisor state? So we could either be running an SVC or a PC these are like syscalls on, um, on Linux, but just completely different. Um, and then there's also uh, what I'm gonna be talking about for the majority of this talk, which is APF authorized data sets. Um, so if we wanna run a program APF authorized, we need two things to be true. It needs to be part of the list of APF authorized libraries, and also the AC1 flag has to be set. So, if, for example, we had write access to an APF authorized library, all we would have to do is compile that um, previous code I showed and, um, and compile it with that AC1 flag and we would be, have full access. This isn't often, I, I, I've never seen it where, since, since I've been testing mainframes, I've never seen it where I could just write to an APF authorized data set. Um, okay, so now, we're going to uh, 
assume that there are, we can't write to it, but there is some vulnerable program that someone has written that is AC1. So how do we find these vulnerable programs? Well, we're looking for a bends, and these are kind of like seg faults in Linux. And there's two, there's two main categories. We have system and user events. We're just going to ignore user events for the time being because that's kind of people, uh, mainframers normally use that to, uh, with the regular, it's, it's like it's, it's an expected bad input that someone's given, gives you a user event. A system event is normally something that happens that the programmer didn't even realize that that could happen. So there's the three main ones that I'm looking for. Uh, SOC 4, SOC 1, and SOC 6. SOC 4 means that we've tried to address an area of memory that uh, we either don't have the right key to or just the memory doesn't exist. Um, then there's also SOC 6. And so in ZArch, every instruction has to be on a half word boundary. And if it's not, you get a SOC 6 event. So everything needs to be on an even byte. Um, and then SOC1 means that we've tried to execute an instruction, but the operand and opcode don't make sense. It doesn't, it's not a real instruction. And if you want to find out more about all the different events, you can read IBM's 854 page manual about every single one. Okay, so we've now, um, we now know that we're looking for events. How do we work out what caused that event? Um, the one I normally am going for is using a sysu dump. And a sysu dump means a user formatted dump. So we can just print this out to any random data set so we can, and we can read it. It's human readable. And I'll explain later what's actually in it. Then we have a c dump, which is only for some very specific uh, compiled programs in language environment. I'll explain what that is later. But um, the problem with this for us is because we break so much stuff when we're causing a bends, sometimes we even break it generating the C dump. Um, and then there is sysm dump, which gives you so much information and it's also not human readable. You need to put it through another program called IPCS that I just don't bother with it. Normally, everything I need is in a sysu dump. Okay, so how do we cause a dump to be generated. We just add a DD statement. Um, so here is a, uh, here's a JCL to run our FTPD server. Um, and we've added a sysu dump DD sysout equals star. So now when the programmer bends, we'll be able to see a long list of all the, th of all the things that were in there. Um, this is the, uh, instead of using, instead of practicing exploit dev, phone dev stuff on ZOS. I like going through NVS 3.8J. It's a 50 year old operating system that's in the public domain. So anyone can just spin up a Docker. You don't require a $10,000 USB to run it. And so, but all of the exploit techniques are the same on NVS 3.8J as uh, modern ZOS. So what's actually in a issue dump? So we have our PSW, which is going to tell us our instruction pointer and like what key we're in when we append it. We're also going to get our completion code. So this will be uh, like SOC4, SOC6, and we also we might get a little uh, a reason code, so some extra information about why it abended. Uh, we also get our list of registers, the um, 16 general purpose registers, and uh, when we also have a list of subpools. And subpools are when I showed you that memory map, you're allowed to ask the system for different parts of that uh, uh, different parts of that memory. And so this is useful for saying, okay, what is what what memory and where has my program got mem where is my what what memory is my program allocated? And then we also get a big dump of uh, all of the contents of what was in the um, the uh, the dumps the uh, the, su the the sub pools we actually have uh, access to. So it's when we dump when we when we get a dump, we need to know what we're actually looking for. And uh, so most programs on ZOS will be compiled language environment. 
what language environment is, is it's kind of a, uh, a common way for, uh, for things to be compiled and for what, what registers will contain what. Because, yeah, um, so for example, if you compile a C program, it will be compiled language environment. And then that will also have DSAs, dynamic save areas. If you, um, one where Zarch doesn't have a stack, so we have to create a stack in memory because stacks are useful. So uh, I'll explain how a DSA overflow works, but you can kind of think of it as a linked list of a lot of stacks. So I'm just going to explain a DSA overflow. This is just a simple um, nothing code that uses gets. So it's, the vulnerability is obvious, but the exploit is a little bit more interesting. So the first thing we do is that the, when we're about to call gets, our cooler DSA has a next available byte to some free memory. And because we're calling gets, we can also see that we have a parameter list which has in register, which has just one uh, parameter, which is the buffer address. So once, now once the gets program start, once the gets function starts, it will create its DSA and will also save the contents of our main functions registers so that once we're finished with gets, we can go restore everything we had beforehand. The, um, we also set a previous pointer in the gets DSA so that we know where our cooler DS DSA is. Then, so to exploit it, we just give it a long buffer and because the buffer um, that we're using is before our gets DSA, we'll end up overflowing our previous DSA pointer in the gets DSA and so I've put uh, for, for reasons, I put a long list of LGBT, 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 and then ended with kale. And then when the, when the gets function ends, what it's gonna try and do is restore its DSA, but it thinks that the DSA is located at address kale. Kale is not a real address, and so it will, uh, it will append. So then instead of doing this, what we do is we fill it with uh, we actually write an exploit for it. So instead of the previous pointer pointing to some random address, we point it to our buffer. Then it will restore all of its registers that it, th that it, that it thought it had at the, when, the get, when the get function was called, but at the moment it's restoring from our buffer. One of those, uh, um, one of those registers it's going to restore is register 14. 14 in language environment is, a, uh, is, a, is an important register because it's the return register. The reason, why we do, the reason why is because the typical way to call a function in, Z, in ZOS, ZArch assembly is a instruction called uh, branch and link register R14, R15, and that says jump to R15 and store the next instruction in memory in R14. So now we've taken over the return register. We then just point that towards our buffer. And then because we're running as APF authorized code, we can just run our Aki flipping uh, code that we've, I showed before. And now that's the case. Um, in the next step, we can uh, uh, just give ourselves privileges to access anything. So, that uh, FTP server on the MVS 3.8J is uh, vulnerable and it's vulnerable to a DSA overflow. So all we have to do is just keep crashing the FTP server by giving it a, um, I'm not gonna go through the vulnerability because it's, it's just a simple C vulnerability, but it's just you give it a user space and then a long list and it crashes on that. And uh, so yeah, so all we have to do is just keep working out what register is being filled with what buffer, then find out when we change that previous DSA pointer, point it towards our buffer, and then edit the return register, and then run some shell code. So um, if you use a mainframe, 
Uh, one of the useful tools on there is something called Rex. It's somewhere between uh, Bash and Python. And so I often use this for generating um, a de Bruijn string on. I, I can use this to generate a data set which contains a, lit, a de Bruijn string. And then I can then use that to try and look for vulnerabilities. But we'll use it to crash the FTP server by giving it a user space de Bruijn string. And what's um, kind of curious about a uh, doing an RCE against ZOS or MVS 3.8J is that most servers are expecting a ASCII text from a normal host and it's going to translate that into EPSIDIC. And so when we've passed our, our normal buffer of just a load of characters, it's actually translated that into uh, EPSIDIC. So 41 will become C1. And this is going to become, this, this makes RCEs on ZOS quite tricky because you have to think about this before you send your buffer. So if we look at the, uh, the registers in our Sysu dump, we can see that uh, register two has been overflown by a EPSIDIC string. Uh, we then, we also see that it's a SOC4. So we can see that in our register two, we had 88 F8 C2 88, but the actual binary that, the actual bytes that we sent to it was 68, 38, 42, 68. So what this means is that uh, the translation table between ASCII and EPSIDIC isn't one to one. So some bytes uh, will both convert down to the same, convert to the same uh, byte. So for example, on the default IBM ZOS translation table, 00 and 80 both convert to 00. But what's more annoying about that is that that means there's some bytes that have nothing to convert into it. So if we needed, if we needed in our buffer a 09 to occur, it's not possible. You just can't, you just can't, there isn't an ASCII bit that will f translate to that. So I, I, it is somewhat frustrating when even though it's vulnerable and it looks exploitable, we had to, we had to change it to 09. So yeah, it means that some addresses are just unaddressable. It also means that we need to encode our sh shell code so that everything translates properly. So um, how do we work out the instructions that we're abending on? Like what's actually causing the abends? So uh, I've written a uh, Rex script to just translate, uh, to disassemble uh, like eight bytes to a, it's Z arch assembly mostly grabbed from someone else's stuff. And so if we want to find out what, did, what, what instruction we abended on, we have a look at our instruction pointer. We then take that instruction pointer, have a look at our, um, at our, mem at our, at the memory, or the, the, the address where it was, uh, where it occurred. We then take that, take that instruction, run it through to Kodai and find out it's a store multiple R12, R14, 0, R2. And this is writing to um, uh, at R2. And this is why we got a SOC4, because it tried to write to that, um, that register we've overflown. So how do, we, how do we solve this? Well, we need to find some area of memory which uh, is in key 8, because if you looked at our PSW at that time, we were in key 8. It also needs to be we then need to create a, an address which will convert to something. So uh, I just chose this one because it converted to something that we have access to. And also to note that in ZOS there's three types of addressing modes. There's 24-bit, there's 31-bit for some reason, and 64-bit. So this is at the moment in 24-bit, so only three bytes. And then so we keep doing it and we see that there's another abend. It's, this one's not particularly interesting. But the next one is, so register 13 is mostly used as the current DSA pointer. So if we've overwritten register 13, it often means that we're onto something good. And we can have a look and we can see that 
So register 13 is overwritten. We have a look at the instruction that we've tried to run and it is load R14, R12, R13. And I've also decoded the next couple of instructions because this is the uh, normal way that you would uh, exit a function and restore your DSA. So you're loading your return register, then you're loading all your other registers, and then you're branching with the bit mask 11111, which means branch every time to register 14. So that's where, um, that's why overriding register 14 lets us control the instruction pointer. Okay, so this is where um, we've now restored all of those uh, registers from our, from our buffer. And you can see that now every register has been replaced. This was the load multiple that happened. And so, and you can also see that the instruction pointer has now been changed to C182F5, which was from our, from our buffer. Oh, and also, you can see that this is a SOC6 because F5 is not on a half word boundary. So, it's another, yeah. Okay, so now that we've edited all of our, um, all of our registers, we want to edit the return address to point to somewhere that we have control over. And so we just choose somewhere that, we just choose an address which does convert nicely and also converts nicely to somewhere we control. And so we just choose this point here and we now get a SOC1. And the reason why we got a SOC1 is because it tried to run some code, we just tried to run our, um, our EPSIDIC translated to Brune string and that's not real Z arch assembly. So all we need to do now is generate some real Z arch assembly and run it. So we take, uh, we take some shell code and all this is doing is just uh, using SVC 35 which is write to operator and this will just print out a nice little message that everyone can read on the syslog. So, and it will say uh, WTO when it runs. And also something to note is that we've done a using star comma R14. The reason why we do this is because we've returned on register 14. And that, that means that the program, the, when, it, when this is compiled, it needs to know where the base register is and that will then allow it to compile things so it knows that for example, when it does load address register one message WTO, where that is and where that, where that is. Okay, so now that we've got our, the code we want to run, we now need to uh, zor, the, zor that code so that we can, um, so that it actually survives a ASCII to EPSI deck translation. And we just choose a, so we need to have a zor key and a Zord shellcode that both survives it. And luckily the XC instruction is a instruction which translates directly from ASCII to EPSIDIC so we don't have to deal with that but that just allows you to Zord, that the XC instruction allows you to Zord any two strings of I think 255 length. So now that we've um, now that we've actually zored it, uh, we now need to go through and I've I've we there's a Python script that we've written to do this automatically, but it will go through and uh, find all of the bytes that convert to the, the EPSIDIC bytes that we need. One thing to know is that uh, not all translation tables will be the same. So one thing you can do is if you only use the printable characters, so like the alphanumerics, you know those ones are likely to be the same on every system. So that's what I would recommend using. So your, the, what you send over will only be ASCII characters or ASCII like alphanumerics. So then all you need to do is um, send that to the FTP server with all of those addresses we've changed and the shell code added and you'll see that it WTOs. The way to, um, so this is just a proof of concept. So you'd only, you'd only, there's only writes to operator, but because the, um, the server is APF authorized, you could get it to do anything. So for example, uh, you could like spawn a reverse shell back to you. Um, you could make it dump the like 
some sensitive data sets. Yeah, you could crash the system. Yeah, you, with, with APF authorized APF authorized code execution, you can do anything. Okay, and um, we also hosted a, a workshop where you can actually do this yourself, which is another reason why I like doing this on MVS 3.8J because you can just uh, create a Docker with a load of labs and just share it with people. So I think that's more interesting. And then uh, got a number of references. So the, um, yeah. Um, uh, any questions? I just, do I, uh, uh, yeah? Uh, no, it's, it, it runs exactly the same. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. If the um, it, it, the emulator is runs exactly the same as uh, the like the heavy metal. Oh. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, so I had a month long holiday, and I by by the end of the holiday. I think I was less rested than I started, so about that, about that long. Oh, yeah. So most most of the times, main oh yeah, uh, the attack surface of a mainframe is mostly it'd mostly be if someone already had access to the like the internal network. It's not really shared. Like there there is some, but not many. And a lot of most of the attacks I've found are LPEs. So you need to have a user on the system to be able to escalate your privileges. But I do have a couple RCEs. So the um, Oh, no, I lost it. Oh, yeah. The um, like. Oh, the other the other thing about LPEs is that you think of a typical like Linux box, and you think, I don't know how many users there would actually be, but on a typical mainframe box, there could be like thousands of users. So an LPE is a little bit more, I'd say, critical on a ZOS box than a Linux box. So let's hear it up for our speaker again. Yes, you did a great job.